Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. What do I mean by finding true north? I mean a world in 2050 where 9 billion people can live well, where we can live within environmental limits and resource constraints, where we've eradicated extreme hunger and poverty, uh, where we've universal primary education and maternal health, and where we have reliable access to safe, clean drinking water and safe, clean energy. In other words, I think a fairer, greener, more resilient, and more inclusive capitalism. And I think that capitalism needs to be enabled by a new model for growth, for prosperity, and for development. Decoupled from the overuse and the abuse of natural resources and the environment. And this evening, what I want to do is to reflect specifically on the role of business in setting us on this pathway to true north. Drawing in particular on a program of research that I've been conducting now for 10 years for the UN Secretary General, first for Kofi Annan and more recently for Ban Ki-moon, which looks at trying to help the UN leadership understand the changing nature of business in society and business attitudes, particularly chief executives' attitudes to sustainability and how those are changing over time. And over the course of that 10 years, we have uh, had responses from more than 2,000 CEOs across more than 120 countries, across 25 industries, uh, and had one-to-ones with more than 200 chief executives to try and get underneath the skin of what they mean by sustainability in the past, present, and future of sustainability. And I think that the transformation gap really became apparent to myself and my team when we sat down and reflected on the 10 years of experience of, of engaging these CEOs on sustainability. And as we reflected on, in particular, the 2010 study, we reflected on the gap between the transformation that the scientific intelligence that we have globally and the economic evidence out there around issues like climate change. We reflected on what they told us would be required to foster a sustainable economy uh, and the pathway uh, that business was on in comparison to that sustainable pathway. And I think it would be fair to say that that pathway is best described not as heading north, but heading south. Uh, a trajectory where we will need 2.3 planets worth of ecological resources to support a global population of 9 billion by 2050, where we face a 40% shortfall in water between forecast global demand and available supply by 2030, and where we know that demand for food will grow by 70% by 2050 at the same time as the rate of growth in agricultural yields uh, is dropping annually. In other words, the gap between systemic change, a radical reshaping of structures and systems that can deliver prosperity and livelihoods, and the enthusiastic pursuit of mitigation incremental achievement that seems to be the hallmark of most companies' approach to sustainability. Our 2010 study, which we called a new era of sustainability, was at the time the largest CEO study conducted on sustainability. And the tenor of the conversations in the main was unremittingly positive. So 93% of chief executives that we spoke to told us that sustainability would be important or very important to the future success of their business. And the majority anticipated a new era within 10 years where sustainability would be embedded in core business. I think they felt that despite a recognition that there were everyday challenges uh, of competing priorities. Sustainability is not the only agenda item that most executives have to deal with. But that market forces would lead companies and industries to embed sustainability at the heart of their businesses. So 
really setting us on a pathway towards the true north of a sustainable economy. But as we reflected on our conversations, we began to compare that bullishness that we heard with the realities that we were seeing in the marketplace. For the last 15 years, I've been focused on working on this agenda with executives around the world. And I think that what we see is the naughty, real-world, messy problems that they face in trying to tackle sustainability in our current economic structure. Watching climate change negotiations where for every step forward, we seem to see four steps backwards. And perhaps strikingly, seeing companies garlanded and celebrated for the most incremental of achievements, cutting wastewater by 5%, increasing rates of recycling by 10%, or putting a woman on the board. And we need to be careful not to denigrate those actions because these individual achievements, each of them incremental targets were the result of smart, committed minds. I, I see that every day. Dedicated to making a difference within their own spheres of influence. So these are not small things at the micro level, but collectively, consistently, we've gone overboard in our reception of their achievement. Instead of recognizing that each of these initiatives was a first step on a long road, in many cases, we rushed to claim that sustainability was now embedded into business. But as we talked to people about our research and shared this positive sentiment amongst chief executives and their assessment of progress, I think we became aware of, of almost a dirty little secret that despite outward confidence and celebration within companies, and despite the absolutely correct growing awareness and commitment to sustainability, many business leaders responsible for executing on this agenda within companies believed, and I would argue do believe, that we're going nowhere fast in terms of the systemic changes that are required. In short, we're not heading for a true north of a sustainable economy, but towards a magnetic north of mitigation and incremental change. A pathway that may be directionally correct and better than the south, but absolutely not headed towards a transformational true north on sustainability. And one that would lead us, even at the height of its ambition, nowhere near the kind of outcome and the destination that's required. As any explorer will tell you, uh, magnetic north and true north are close cousins, but the gap between the two has the potential to leave us miles off course, especially on a journey that will take several generations. So first, the good news. I think we see clear evidence of a growing awareness and commitment to sustainability amongst companies per se. You can see that demonstrated in things like just the pure numbers of companies, for example, signing up to the UN Global Compact, who are engaging in reporting for the first time, who have corporate responsibility strategies, who are beginning to think about these issues. But the bad news, as we talk to the leaders in the field, those companies who have been leading on sustainability for a decade or more, the sense of bullishness in 2013 that pervaded the conversations in 2010 had in large part disappeared. And replaced by a sense of frustrated ambition. Frustrated with the mixed signals from consumers, demanding that companies do more on sustainability, but unwilling to reward them at the till. Frustrated with investors, apparently interested in sustainability, but unable or unwilling to factor performance into assessment and valuation in the main. Frustrated with governments unable to provide clear policy direction to create the right enabling environment for business to succeed. And frustrated with themselves in many cases in terms of the pace of change and also their own inability to measure, track and communicate the bottom line business benefits of sustainability. And I think that this frustration is a signal that far from continuing towards the new era anticipated by CEOs in 2010, actually we may have become complacent about incremental change, 
embedding sustainability into communications and rhetoric, but not into the realities of everyday business. Just one third of the thousand CEOs that we surveyed believe that the global economy is on track to meet the needs of a growing population sustainably. And just a third believe that business is doing enough to address sustainability challenges. And so it's clear that business as usual approaches will not be enough. And our faith in the incremental can sometimes do more harm than good, particularly if we conflate and confuse incremental with transformational. Just initial responses from our three other uh, panellists to Peter's picture, which is a kind of interesting mixture of the gloomy and the hopeful. Um, Neil, what's your kind of take on what you've heard? I think firstly, from a business perspective, what systemic transformation actually means. It means that if you're somebody doing, let's say, my role within BT, which is trying to catalyze and drive change, you need incrementalism because it gives you momentum. It gives you the proof points that you can save money and energy, you can engage suppliers in new and interesting ways and pass that value through to your customers. You need all of that to kind of give credibility, to do the more disruptive things. But the real challenge comes to, you're ultimately going to ask somebody within the organization to make a different decision around how they actually run their P&L. And that means you're gonna ask them to take a personal risk that could wind up with them being fired. Um, and the thing you have to ask yourself is, is it this risk or is it another risk? Because I think personally, most people who commit to this agenda are pretty fearless and they have no real issue putting themselves in the line at any stage, but trying to actually convince the people around you to make different decisions. And if I can kind of give you a, um, a very um, recent example from uh, within BT. So when we were looking seriously at the circular economy, and Peter will remember this, the, the, the modem, which is, you know, the, most of you will have these in your home that, that provides you with the connectivity. We knew how to make a modem 100% out of circular economy um, principles, but there was a degree of risk associated with that. So there was a supplier that was not yet tried and tested. We could not prove um, to the people in the business that they could do two million units and they could also do it exactly when we were launching Sport as an organization, where there was about two billion pounds in investment already committed, where one person had the responsibility in the organization for delivering on that agenda. So we then looked at, well, what has the circular economy taught us about you know, how we can think differently, think more considered as a business? And we launched uh, Home Hub 4 um, using the principles of a circular economy, which is not 100% uh, designed for reuse, not using recycled components, but it is, I think, building on a lot of the principles we'd learned. Like, for example, it goes through the letterbox, um, so you know, it avoids all the trips to the, to the post office. It, um, it uses less materials, less energy, all the kind of the incremental things that, that Peter is talking about, but there was less risk associated with that, with that model. And in the end, we went for plan B, um, because you know, as, as a kind of um, a change agent in an organization, you know, you really need to reflect deeply around, are you going to ask you know, somebody in our consumer business, the CEO of that business, to make a different decision at a time where basically the future of the business hangs in the balance? And that's the thing I really worry about at, at night is, you know, can, you, can you ask people to take those big bets on your behalf? And what's the right time? I think all of these things work best, particularly the transformational agenda, when the business is on the offense. Not a lot of businesses out there are on the offense at the moment. Most businesses are on the defense. And so what I'd say to you is, bide your time. Your time will come. Or go work for another organization who is on the offense. Because at best, when a company's on the defense, you've got to link yourself to taking cost out of the organization. And that doesn't feel very transformative. Great. Thank you very much. Emma, your kind of first take on what Peter said. I think it's a really honest reflection of where we've got to in the sustainability debate, so I, I very much welcome the, the research, particularly given that my focus for the last 25 years has been within financial services. I think there are times when you can sit down and uh, take an initiative like UNPRI, you can total this massive size of funds under management, which are supposed to be behind this massive sustainability push, 
And yet I can still spend our meetings with the chairman of companies, the chief executives of companies, the finance directors of companies who do not recognize this in the meetings that they have um, with their investors. Absolutely recognizing that you know there are good com companies that sure. communicate well, and equally there are some investors that are doing some important work in this area. It's about the mainstreaming of, of um, where the sustainability debate sits, and um, I've spent too much of the last you know decade or so going round this conversation. If only, if only our clients requested more. Um, information about our sustainability performance as, as, as investors, we'd be able to push that debate with, um, with the companies. If only the company, companies communicated more, we'd perhaps see these things um, move into a different place. I think that the time has come to recognise that there are groups of leaders and we need to work together in a, in a very different way. My current title uh, at Jupiter is Director of Stewardship. And that links to a trend um, in the mainstream investment community that has come out of um, the financial crisis that we went through a few, few years back, where um, invest the, the focus was put on investors. Are you acting as stewards of um, the individuals, your clients, well-earned savings, and are you um, having the correct debate with, with, with companies? That allowed me, without using the word sustainability, to create a different dynamic um, in, in terms of the meetings that we as investors were having with companies, focusing on the long term. And within those meetings, you can weave in a whole range of issues that would come under the label of sustainability, but actually need, uh, we, we, start to, we need a different term as well. And, and um, we need to latch on to those themes that are absolutely relevant to the businesses that we're meeting with. And each company will have a very different sustainability theme. I thought Emma's point about sort of needing a different name for this is really interesting because I, I spent nearly 14 years running an organisation called Ethical Corporation, which focused on sort of independent journalism and events on corporate responsibility, where we'd convene lots of panels like this. And, um, and now I, I left that and started something called Innovation Forum because I believe actually the solution is, is to talk much more about innovation because everybody loves innovation. Innovation can be anything. Uh, and that's good and bad, but it's good in a way because you can frame sustainability around innovation much more now for, for many of the reasons that my fellow panellists have outlined. I think that's fantastic. I would like to congratu congratulate Peter and Accenture for doing a very rigorous study for a number of years, which I've followed since its inception. And I think we should point out that Accenture is way ahead of its other, other competitors in this space. I think the challenge for, for Accenture and others who are genuinely listened to at places like the World Economic Forum, which do make quite a big difference to CEOs, is to start talking about blueprints, uh, to start talking about examples. At Neil's example, how do we get those out there so that we can see a way forward to actually deliver some of this stuff in business and avoid this endless jargon that we hear from the sustainability community about positive loop curves and bending the net positive left or right, whatever you're supposed to do this week. You know, actually talking about things like the circular economy, which are relatively solid, they're a framework that people can understand I think that's incredibly helpful because we all sort of know what that means if we sit and think about it for a moment. So I think a simplification is, is, is very important. But I think what we do need to do is, is have more leadership groups of companies uh, in collaboration with multi-stakeholder, uh, with other stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder way. And I'll give you a few examples. Um, if you look at palm oil, if you look at deforestation, an area that I'm working in a lot at the moment, we've seen unbelievable changes in the last two years, which haven't yet filtered through to what you hear about every day as consumers, because it's, it's very complicated and not everyone takes an interest. But companies like Wilmar, who control 45% of the world's palm oil trading, have committed to zero deforestation footprints by the end of 2015. That's huge. That changes the game. Um, and we're starting to see companies like that, who no one's ever heard of, make really dramatic commitments to sustainability. And that's to be welcomed. That's all part of this debate. The big challenge is, how do they get there? What are the problems and how do those solutions get scaled to other businesses? And this is where I think companies like BT, companies like Extension, investors like uh, Jupiter have a key role to play, and the RSA actually, Matthew, in helping explore some of these blueprints uh, in a more systemic way so we can start, start to see how we break down the barriers. Um, so on the one hand, I can, be, I can agree with everything Peter said and be quite kind of gloomy about stuff. On the other hand, I look at companies like Wilmar making unbelievably uh, transformative commitments, if not yet progress, and think, well, maybe we can do this. Uh, so I welcome the speech and I welcome the studies, and I, and I just hope that we can, we can find a way forward.